I've got a few things I want to hang on the limited space right next to my garage door just to get them off the bench tops where they've been sitting for a while. And of course I'm going to do this in the most complicated way possible. I've already used this system previously. It's called a French cleat. I just didn't know that at the time. When I did my workshop pegboard, I actually used a small cleat to hang uh, it on the wall. So I stole that off Woodwork for Mere Mortals, as usual, 90% of the content on this channel probably is. This time, I'm knowing what it's called, I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to do it on a slightly bigger scale and make a few proper cleats on both sides of the garage. I don't have the easiest way to do this available to me, which of course is sitting a table saw on a 45 degree angle and running your board through to make those two interlocking pieces. The way I did it last time was with the 45 degree bevel on the circular saw, but that only worked because the cleat I was making was six inches long. This time, I'm trying to make a few that are 30 or 40 centimeters long, and I couldn't just figure out a way to do that safely on such a small board with this. Then I had an idea. When I got my router kit, it actually came with three bases, only two of which I've used so far. The trim base, and of course the plunge base, which connects it to my router table. I also have this one. That's called a tilt base. And until this point, I only really got it because it was basically free buying the router kit, and I had no real idea of what I was going to use it for. Now I do. Here is the old router table base off my router table, which I keep all my scraps, and I'm glad I did, because the multifunction table is about to get another function. First thing I did was pop the battery on, flip this upside down, and ensure in this orientation that the router would actually not hit any of the underside bits of the table, and the good news is I'm just safe. So now we'll roughly position that up in the center, like so, and mark out where I need to route a way to flatten this out. Of course I've already done most of the hard work with the base, this should be fairly straightforward. I can use the existing indentation in order to set the depth for my new cut, like so. So there. This doesn't have to be very accurate at all, you're going to be able to eyeball it. Test fit, and that should give me plenty of space. That's where I want my base to be. So I'm gonna mark my drill holes with an awl. So I dove into my little bits box and found some machine screws of the correct size and length. I've drilled through the larger holes, not that they're that much larger, from this side, so any blowouts on that side, and now we get to countersink them down as well. Well, as usual, that took a lot of fluffing about to get the holes right. I should really take some more care when I'm building these bases. I always seem to have the trouble where I need to end up making the holes big to give the screws enough play to go in correctly. However, a bit of recycling seems to be done. Let's see how much depth we can get with the router bit. And if it actually fits in the table. What the? It was about two or three millimeters off. You probably can't see it, but the bit is hitting in there. And I think I figured out why. Because when I measured it last time, I had this extra bit of clearance. And now with that taken off, I do not. I can drill new holes, or what I think I'm going to do is actually just cut away a tiny bit of the base. Yeah, I think I'll do that instead. Oh dear, one thing after another. I've got the inverted jigsaw set up. I actually needed these to raise because I'm being really lazy and not unscrewing that. And I wanted the jigsaw blade to not cut into my router base. Only be a few seconds work. Now 
There we go, that should give me the clearance I need for the bit. Okay, that's now attached. This lovely clean bit here that I did the roughly with the jigsaw is thanks to my new expensive straight bit. So I actually decided to invest some money, that $35 I think it was from Carbotec, to get some decent router bits over time. I've only bought the one for the moment. Those ultra bits I got from Bunnings, they were 50 bucks for the kit, so I really can't complain when a high quality bit is $35 but they are kind of rubbish i've already noticed compared to something you do get what you pay for with router bits lovely thing about this one was that it's 19 mils so when i want to cut dados for three quarter inch 19 mil lumber i'm going to be able to do it with one pass which is the reason i selected this big fat one and it's also going to be what i use for my edge jointing however here i decided to clear out that amount of space because again, bigger bit for the heavy work that's going to be needed. To install, you actually have to have it in the 90 degree or you can't lock it. The router in, and wind it down, test that. Yeah, that's pretty good. Lock that. Now you'll see what's going to happen up top here. This is going to be my 45 degree bevel cut and I want to bring it up just a little bit and we can start running some boards. I ended up needing to switch out my good new router bit for my old 12mm router bit because of the length. The new 19mm was only 19mm high and when you're on a 45 degree angle, I can't do the mathematics that quickly, but it's too short to make the correct bevel cut. This one is longer and it's in. The way I'm doing it, I have to be careful because this is one of the rare instances with a router table fence where you do need to be roughly perpendicular to the blade. Normally the orientation doesn't matter because you're spinning at 90, but now I've got a set cutting position, I have to be a little bit more accurate. Not terribly so, it is only for a click. I'm not exactly doing bespoke joinery here. However, my test pieces are starting to come out well. That's about the depth that I need them to be. And to get there, I'm gonna do it in several passes. So that's basically setting the fence up to a few mils, running these through using some push blocks, and then tapping the fence back and running through again. This was a test piece, but it's actually a fairly nice length. So I'm probably gonna end up using it on the wall. About halfway through here, just trying to get my fence ready for the next pass. That's just starting to hit. Yeah, that's a good one. Clamp that down. All right, let's do another pass or two. There we go, and uh, that's about as good as I'm gonna be able to get it. Tiny little bit of there, should just snap right off. Excellent. That is my 45 degrees made in about 45 minutes instead of 45 seconds, which it would have been if I had a table saw. So my little French cleat is ready to go on the wall. In fact, this one I might actually use for the mount. I'll make some more slightly thicker boards to be the strong support on the wall. But fun little exercise in making a new multifunction base for the workbench. And it has been quite a success, even if it took, as usual, three times longer than needed. All right, that's stage one now. I've got this setup done. Let's try to make some French cleats for the wall. I've screwed a marker onto the moving part of the garage door. I really don't think this is going to work, but let's see what happens. Oh, it snapped. Oh my god, it worked! <laughs> there we go. I'm just trying to trace out where I have to avoid, and that looks like it. <laughs> MacGyvered. I can't believe that actually worked. Darkened up a little bit, but now I can see where my mechanism moves, and I can get an idea of how much space I have. This bad boy is the main thing I want to hang up and it's gonna fit in about there. The other one's gonna be the hose, which will live above the vacuum when it is not in use. 
I'm going to line it up with this shelf. So I've got 24 centimeters for the top one, and I'm going to line up with this shelf. I've got at least 40 on there. So they're the two uh, first cleats I'm going to put in. There's the finished product for the wall cleat, and here's probably the little one that I'll use in order to make the mounts. So they're going to sit in together quite nicely, just like that. Looks good. What did I say? 24. It's going to be about there. And then another 40 odd can be, let's do 42. That's a nice number. There. Honestly, this back bit is a bit buggy, so I probably won't end up using that. These don't have to be exact. This is actually a bit of scrap off the ukulele project. However, it is a very good match for the shape of the square cut on the crib. And it's 19 mil, which means whenever I'm trying to cross cut on a small board like this, it's very, very handy because it gives the Craig jig something to rest on. These aren't going to take a lot of weight, so I've just got two holes in the small, three holes in the big one pulled out some plugs and the last long screws that I could find. They're not ideal, uh, they're pine screws, but you know, they'll hold up the weight that they've been asked to do. Drill a few holes. They were the easy holes. Now we've got to drill the hard ones. Hammer time. Just in case there are any masonry novices, kind of like me, watching this, two things you should probably change on your drill before you start tackling bricks as opposed to wood. A lot of drills will have two speed settings. Two is the fast setting on mine. So I'm going to crank it down to one, which will increase my torque but decrease my speed, which is what you want when doing masonry. And also, you will hopefully have a hammer on your drill so you can change the clutch to that setting. If you don't have a hammer drill, if you've only got a regular drill, then you're going to have a bad day because getting through brick is not fun. The other thing I'm going to point out too is make sure you don't try and drill through the mortar. It'll be really easy, but funnily enough, things will start falling off the wall very, very quickly. So a hammer drill is more expensive, although Audi do sell them from time to time. I'm not sure how long it will last. But if you only got a few things to do, then hell, it's probably a lot cheaper than picking up a Makita. But, well, I love my Makita hammer drill. It's where this all started. Check the channel intro. You're also going to need masonry bits. This is a regular drill bit, high speed, good for plastic, wood, metal, nearly everything except masonry. You will break these if you try it on bricks. Masonry bits, if I can get it in focus, there we go, look at that. They've got a different shaped head on them. They're designed to take the hammer action of the drill and to clear out all the sand and gravel that they're going to generate. The last problem we're going to have is that, well, my walls are completely and utterly uneven. These bricks are textured uh, and not laid with 100% accuracy. So, well, luckily this doesn't need to be perfect. And it helps if you turn that hammer function on that you mentioned earlier. So when I make the mounts, they'll sit in there like that, and we'll have happy days. It's pretty strong. Next, I set up a rip cut for this old piece of plywood that I'm going to be using to make the actual mounting pieces to hang on the cleats.
two of my usual problems. The bloody vacuum hose getting caught on the edge of the board and making it hard to push forward. And then secondly, when you get towards the end, I lost concentration because of the hose and the edge guide wanders a bit. It always tends to happen as you sort of pull towards the edge of the board. So I do like the rip cut. It's completely user error. I just have to practice more on doing that accurately. The good news is that this piece does not need to be terribly accurate. In fact, it was so bendy, it's why I decided to use it and try to square up this edge, and instead I've ended up cutting it that way. But, Carla, what can you do? I've marked out the first 7cm wide cut that I need to make to fit the blower in there, and then I'll end up, I think, routing some side pieces to give it the correct fit. I've left this long for the moment on purpose because it's going to let me handle the wood a bit better and then right at the very end I can just chop that off. Man, I am just the master of excellent cutting. I quickly cleaned up my dodgy cut with the straight bit on the router table. Now to make it fit better, I've got my tool. That's how it's going to slide on and that needs to slide up this way a bit. So I need to mark out this widening section here, measure it relatively carefully and notch that out so I can drop this in and have it sit securely and not fall off the wall. That's the fit. There you go, that looks pretty good. Comes up and out, in and down, and it can't fall forwards. I think I might need some braces underneath this, but for the moment, we'll see how glue and screw goes. I cut that down to length, I put my pilot holes through there, and now I'm going to glue those two bits together. This plywood must be 100 years old, it is so dark. We'll test the weight of that and then see if I need to add any braces at the front. Okay, Clamp's just there to hold it while I'm drilling. Well, the short answer to the question, do I need to put braces on these, is yes. I put it on about three seconds. It was very easy to determine that the strength of that little cleat was just going to tilt forward too much. So, quickly cut out some triangles. Screw them on, nothing special to see there. And my first French cleat is done. Sits up nicely. Lower back. Ta-da! Now, as all of these tools are gonna to be unique to your own situation, there's no point in me showing you how to make the rest of them, but I've got some more to do here and I'm gonna put some clamp ones over on the other side and that should help get a few things off the floor and off the benches and give them a home for the first time as I've acquired them over the past couple of months. All right, let's knock those out.